I'll assume that's happened because I can't see what I'm presenting. So the plan for this evening's session is to um, give you um, a brief introduction to the um, climate change um, programme through Warwick County Council, which will be presented by um, Andrew Powell. And then we have an overview of the Green Shoots um, Fund for round two and the application process um, by Matt and Ruth. We'll have a Q&A session where we can um, answer any clarification questions about the fund. And I'll pop back on at the end to um, just update you on the support that we as Warwickshire Carver can um, provide. So um, without further ado, I'll pass over to um, Andrew. Thank you very much. And I'm just about to get a very brief presentation onto your screens. Right, I hope you can all see that. We can, thank you. Excellent, thanks. I just wanted to start off by saying um, how pleased I am as a officer who works for Warwickshire County Council to come and present to you tonight. We're the, we are the funder and we're here to talk to you about green shoots, but I'm not going to dwell on that because a colleague is going to come in after me to explain some of the more detail uh, points about green shoots phase two. What I wanted to talk about very quickly was our commitment to sustainable futures and climate change. I put on you know, this slide, it says it's a top prior priority for Warwickshire County Council, and it absolutely is. And I wanted to assure you of that this evening. The wording on the, um, the left of this slide, sustainable futures and climate change, that is one of the three priorities that are mentioned in our, in our council plans. So that is the, the most senior sort of plan that we have within the County Council that guides all the work that we do. And we see this as one of our our top three priorities and there it is in black and white for you. So that's, that's a direct quote from our council plan. Our council plans are freely available on the internet. Uh, in terms of our commitment, we have got a commitment to net zero um, and we have um, made a, or declared a climate emergency. Um, in terms of biodiversity, we're very good at biodiversity. We've got a good track record in terms of our work on bio biodiversity and sustainability in terms of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in terms of our net zero county commitment, we have uh, made a commitment to for the, for the whole of Warwickshire to be um, net zero by 2050, and that's a firm commitment in our minds and fits in with national legislation as well. And that's really part of what we're doing tonight. Green Shoots is, um, is part of that um, net zero county commitment. Um, if I move on a slide, I just wanted to give you a couple of numbers. I'm not going to bore you for very long at all. I wanted to, but I wanted to give you two numbers really um, this is this is one of the numbers so decarbonizing our own estate in terms of our commitment we do work hard to do this in terms of the recent performance that we've uh, delivered we've reduced our 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 own carbon footprint from about 11,000 tons or over 11,000 tons to less than 8,000 tons so a 31 percent um, reduction there which is really really good performance and we have got plans to bring that down even further um, and the other number I wanted to give you is the scale of the challenge that we're looking at. So when we look at the um, the amount of carbon released within Warwickshire, and this is from everybody in, in Warwickshire, these are all the people, all the industry, um, the commerce and the industry, we're talking about over 5 million tonnes a year. So in terms of our own carbon impact, it's relatively minor, 2% says the pie chart in terms of the public sector total. But in terms of the amount of carbon and therefore the scale of the challenge we have for Warwickshire, it is big. In terms of the domestic total, it's 17 percent. That is the domestic total, so that's mainly heating and energy consumption within domestic buildings. Transport is the, is the biggest sector, single sector, at 44 percent, and that includes all the domestic, the commercial and the industrial travel. Welcome, whoever that was. Um, but that, what I really wanted to emphasise is the scale of the challenge. And that's really, you know, when people ask me about who will be involved in our action on climate change, everybody within the council, everybody within the county of Warwickshire, members of public, people who work for businesses within the, um, within the county, everybody will be involved. And that's why it's so, um, it's so great that we're, uh, we're launching um, Green Shoots Phase 2 tonight. And I just wanted to end with that. 
Thank you, Andrew. That's fabulous. We'll just uh, let you stop sharing your screen and then we'll uh, lead straight on to Matt, I think, first for the next bit of the presentation. Thanks. I think I found the right button. Hi there, yeah, just finding my my slides to share. So yes, welcome. Um, we're very excited to be able to launch the, the phase two scheme. Um, so what I'm going to talk about in this section, first of all, just to rewind a little bit and talk about phase one of the scheme. Then I'll go on to talking about this phase. So why are we doing it? Who's eligible for the scheme? What sort of criteria are we looking at in terms of the assessment? We'll look at the timelines and the deadlines and then on to how to contact us. So in phase one, what we did, we, we established the scheme way back in February 2021. We had a million pound funding pot for green shoots. And this is all about funding community schemes, bottom up schemes related to climate change, schemes designed by community groups so that, so that groups know what's happening in their area and they can connect them to the local community. These schemes are closely aligned to our council plan priority that, um, that Andrew's talked about. We funded 69 projects and we're very pleased about that. Some of the case studies are available um, on our website and Ruth will talk about some case studies later on. Phase two is going to open in June 2022, and that will award the remaining £335,000. So the aims and principles will remain the same, but with one key difference, phase two hopes to address the imbalance of funds allocated across the county, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, as with phase one, eligible organisations are not-for-profit, community and voluntary organisations in Warwickshire, so essentially constituted organisations. Schools, if applying as a parent teachers association or as a friends of group, excluding independently funded schools, town and parish councils, and for Nuneaton and Bedworth, um, the council there, because um, in that borough, we don't have a town and parish council structure. So the purpose of the scheme is as before, we're funding carbon reduction projects, also called carbon mitigation, climate change adaptation projects, those with environmental benefits, and crucially, with community benefits. So the majority of applications in 2021 came from the Stratford and Warwick districts, with the, with the majority of funding also being allocated to these areas. So in phase two, we want to rebalance this so that each area receives a similar level of funding per capita from the whole £1 million fund. Therefore, whilst funding is available for all areas, we're especially keen to get applications for projects based in the Nuneat and Bedworth and North Warwickshire areas, but equally we'd strongly encourage projects that work with or benefit residents in those underrepresented areas. So those projects don't necessarily need to be run from an organisation in these areas. Indeed, it can be made and managed from any location. You might also have a project in mind that provides county-wide benefits or to a mix of locations. In these cases, we'd like you to think about how you could maximise the benefit to the north. We try to make this programme as easy to apply as possible and refine the system since phase one. So don't go and think this is a, a bureaucratic scheme. We hope you will take the opportunity that this funding presents. So in terms of some initial guidance, I'll talk about what we'll be looking for. So the phase two criteria 
in line with the scheme objectives, in simple terms, we're looking for sound deliverable projects that are good for climate change and community benefits that ideally outlast the life of the project. So there were some gateway questions um, so that there are some key comp components that make up an eligible project. So does it address the green shoots objectives that I've talked about? Does it provide a benefit to Warwickshire? And is it for, from an eligible group? And also, does the organisation satisfy what are called the subsidy control rules? Now, this won't affect many of you. But in essence, it relates to a threshold of grant support provided from all sources over the last three years. So we're happy to discuss this on a case by case basis. We think this may affect you. So on the first cost of cost effective environmental benefits, simply this is about is the project good value for money? So into your answers on climate change and environmental benefits, you need to integrate how this will benefit the relevant geographical area. We're looking to understand the nature of the benefit and impact to the project and what will change as a result. How will you know it's been a successful project? And why do you and your community consider this necessar necessary? And is the grant needed to make this happen or to accelerate it? On costs, we're happy to part fund projects, either when the additional money comes from the group or from another grant source. Our review will be based on what the Green Shoots grant will be used for. So as far as possible, please specify what element of the project relates to the grant shoots, Green Shoots application. Again, I'm happy to discuss this with you. If you're, you're submitting an application that provides benefits to a mix of locations, it would be helpful if you can identify what costs provide, what costs relate to the benefits of the targeted underrepresentative areas. In terms of the assessment, officers with high levels of expertise in the projects will be assessing the application and they'll be referring to similar projects both in this phase and in the last to reach their conclusions. Do bear in mind this is a competitive process. So on community benefits, Importantly, we want to understand how the project will benefit the local community. We want to understand the extent of the benefits to the, the community. Perhaps there are volunteers involved would encourage that. You might want to seek the support of a local councillor. Is it free to access? And is the project located um, in an area that's free for everyone to access? Um, or perhaps it's gated and locked off. So as in the environmental section, we're also looking to understand how communities in underrepresented or socially deprived areas will benefit. On deliverables, we need to be confident that the proposed project can actually be delivered. Clearly not all projects will need to be managed in the same way, but generally, the larger the project, the greater focus is needed here. We want to understand a little bit about team experience. We want a delivery plan. That delivery plan needs to talk about dependencies and risks and also mitigation steps. Again, this needs to be posed to us based on the on proportion of scale. We need to have confidence that the project will be executed within the budget and it's based on realistic and appropriate timescales. We need you to think about permissions you might need. Have you obtained them or are you planning for them? For example, some solar projects and heat pump projects may well need permissions from the distribution network operator, in this case, Western Power. Some tree planting and ecology projects may need landowner permissions, whilst others need to be subject to planning review. Do consider this ahead of time. A lasting legacy once the project is completed is exactly the sort of thing we're looking for. 
So will the benefits consider, continue after the conclusion of the project? What ongoing maintenance will be needed? So perhaps maintenance of a heating system. Is that maintenance costed in? And how will it be resourced? Looking at handover, handover perhaps to the operator. How's that considered? And particularly we're interested in projects that can be showcased to other organisations and where possible um, replicated across the county um, or to other areas. We need a plan um, to, to resource um, and, and assess the post project benefits. So you'll have stated project impacts and the question about environmental and community benefits. We want to understand how, how these can be monitored. We want to be informed on how the project is, is progressing. And information on monitoring where this is available can be helpful. So this is not in any way bureaucratic. We want to keep up, keep up the dialogue with you. We may not be able to help if there, we may be able to help if there are problems. At the end of the project, we'd like you to be able to assess if the project has met your original expectations. Here, we will look at your original statement for success measures and compare them against what you what you've achieved. You might have planted 50 trees or installed a 50 kilowatt solar panel or developed an awareness campaign. Post project evaluation is a little bit different in that you better assess benefits after the project has been operating for a little while. After a year, how many trees are still alive? How much electricity has been generated from that solar panel? You might have carried out a survey to determine awareness levels that you can report on. It's just as important here that you know, it's just important for us that you know we've thought about this and are built in the capacity to do all of this. So the timeline for applications is it opens on the 17th of June. And then we've got a period, um, an op application window so that the application closes on the 19th of September. Targeted award date then is the 31st of October, and then you will need to return your grant offer letters within two weeks, and then you can get started with that particular application. So we, we really want to help you with with these applications. We're really looking to have high quality applications. Um, so either contact Carver or us at the addresses here and we can put them in the chat. Thanks very much. I'll stop sh stop sharing my screen. Can everyone hear me OK? I think my mic's playing up now. Seems to be having a nightmare. OK, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for that, Matt. I think Ruth's going to take over with some case study examples now. So we'll let Ruth set up her presentation. Um, the chat's open, so I can see Ian's asked a couple of questions already. But if people do have questions about um, specifics, please pop them in the chat and we'll be picking those up shortly. you're muted Ruth but I'm sure you're saying some lovely things to us yeah sorry okay uh, can everyone see my uh display okay yeah we can see yeah. that good day okay so um I'm going to run through some examples of projects that we have already awarded funding to and are already underway in the first uh tranche of green shoots um there's 12 that I'm giving specific examples of out of the 69 um, in all cases, uh, when the when the award was given to the project, it was given on the basis that it had the environmental benefits that we're looking for, um, the reduction in, of uh, climate impact uh, or an adaptation uh, benefit, and also that it has community benefits and is uh, available to 
lots of members of the community to access and it has some uh, longevity, it has a, a legacy. Uh, so you'll see as we're going through that all these examples have got similar um, in benefits associated with them uh, and that email address at the top there, sorry, the web address at the top there, that's uh, got some other examples of um, case studies, so more words and a few pictures just to give you some ideas and if you're looking for ideas, our contact details are repeated at the end and they've been put in the chat and you can just run by an idea with us or say, has this been done in the past? Is there somebody uh, that I can get in touch with that can give me some pointers? Um, so uh, thinking about biodiversity projects in the first instance, quite a few of our successful applicants were of this nature, sometimes combined with another piece of work or sometimes just a standalone. Um, so we have some examples of rural type biodiversity improvement projects, for example, on recreation grounds or in parks. And uh, the first pitch there on the left, that's from Farnborough uh, in a park. And you can see there, there's lots of community involvement, all different generations uh, pushing their sleeves up, getting their hands dirty, digging holes, planting trees, uh, sowing wildflower seeds. Uh, centrally there, mm. Uh, we have more of an um, urban location that's in the middle of rugby and they've built a load of um, raised beds. They're going to grow herbs there and those herbs will be available for anybody to pick and go and uh, make their dinner with if they wish. Um, Ruth, Ruth, it's Rachel. Can I just interrupt? We've had a request. Can you just make your presentation? Can you press the, the presenting slide bit so that we want to see bigger pictures? Yeah, I did. I did try to do that, and I wasn't clear whether it was showing it that way or not. Is it doing it now? Oh, there we go. That seems to have done something from my view. Not changed it. It might just take a minute to load. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's quite a big presentation because it's got lots of pictures in it. Yeah. Well, we'll share so, yeah, the that presentation with everybody afterwards anyway. Yeah. That's right, show all the pictures. So that central um, one, that's uh, rugby. Um, and then the one on the right, that's uh, Shuttington. They've got a wildflower meadow, including a pond. They're trying to attract all different wildlife. Um, and at the very bottom, that's uh, Liso uh, Farm, Children's Forest. So that's specifically getting children involved in the process of planting the trees and uh, seeing um seeing them develop they'll be re-invited back to have have some more of a look so i i can't my sort of uh still loading does that change the no. does that change at your end no. unfortunately not uh ruth um your sound dipped out a little bit there as well that sound, we're having a few teams gremlins tonight um is it worth yeah someone else trying to share the slides and click through for you or I don't know whether that would work um I'll just um I'll just try again yeah I think it's my pal my, my powerpoint but um anyway I'll just carry on and have a little chat about yeah um I've got your your pdf based version I can mm. share that if people would like that. Yeah, should we try that? Thanks, Matt. Sorry. OK, one sec. Um, yeah, so we've got all sorts of biodiversity type projects um, going on, some on church grounds or in school grounds. Uh, one of the schools is uh, Raceley Schools in Nuneaton. Uh, and they're putting up um, wildlife cameras so so the children and the wider community can see what's going on in their local area in terms of wildlife both day and night. Um, town centre examples as well as the rugby one include uh, Kenilworth and Stratford. Uh, we've got an example of uh, Living Walls which is um, Forest of Hearts are producing vertical uh, greening and they're going to put that in uh, car park areas. Uh, at hospitals so that um, out that that space which is normally quite grey can look a bit more lively. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how you're getting on Matt with your <coughs> loading of my PDF, my my uh, PowerPoint is still whirring away thinking about something. Okay just let me know when you want the next slide on. 
Yeah, so the next one, which is uh, Priory Park, which is in Warwick, Friends of Priory Park, uh, planted some trees and they organised them um, uh, open day. So you can see that uh, there's a poster that they used to advertise that to encourage people to come. And we'd really like to uh, see that sort of activity happening where, where there's specific days where people can come and get involved. Um, and the Lord Lieutenant came, had his photograph taken, planting a tree at that one. Um, sorry, I can't, I can't see it yet, Matt, have you been able to? So we're now on the Eco Garden one. For your reference, Ruth, we're just up to one called Biodiversity and Community, which is about an eco garden and labyrinth. Yeah, We've just perfect. Seen yeah, I can see that now, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, that's um, that's a project in Nuneaton in a church in church grounds. And they had you can see on the left, there's um, just a blank canvas, really just a load of green. And that's been um, updated and improved. And they've put in a, a spiral path, which you can walk around. And it's really lovely. They've got some open days coming up that you can see listed there. Um, so it'd be really I'm sure they'd really appreciate it if some uh, some people on this call uh, went and had a look at what they've achieved with a quite modest amount of funding. Uh, yes, yeah, so moving on please, on, please, Matt. Um, so here's an example of a renewable energy project. So we had a few solar panel successful bids. Um, so on schools, community centres and churches, this is an example of a church called St George's in Rugby. And you can see they've got quite a big array there. Uh, they were funded uh, almost to the maximum amount of funding but they I believe they've done the majority of that within that funding as Matt was saying earlier we can add you can add funding either from your own uh, fundraising or from another funding part to to uh, uh, contribute to a bigger project if that's what you'd like to do uh, thank you Matt we had a few different uh, energy type projects so um, taking on a, a fabric first approach trying to improve community buildings and make them more insulated in order that uh, any heating that is put into them is the most efficient and obviously that's even more important now all of our bills are increasing as well so some community centres have had loft insulation new windows um, improved heating systems uh, and then thinking about the lighting on the left hand side there's a couple of parishes that have had uh, their street lights upgraded to LED and some other efficient lighting systems, including some uh, LED floodlights at a football pitch in rugby. Um, moving on, please, Matt. Uh, we've got various uh, green transport type activities. So some organisations have put in bike racks or built a cycling path. Uh, we've got a number of um, electric vehicle charging points that have gone in in village halls uh, and also at Mighton Hospice. So this particular example on the left there is Wollstone and um, we've also got um, Cycle Buddies which is a new project uh, focused mostly around Warwick but they're looking to expand into other areas of Warwickshire uh, and what happens is uh, you're an experienced cyclist and you're willing to give some of your time helping a novice uh, cyclist get used to riding on the road, looking after their bicycle and all the other things that are involved in being a regular cycle commuter or uh, cycling for pleasure. Um, so that's a really good scheme and they're actively looking to expand into other parts of Warwickshire. So if you think you could join in with that and give them a helping hand, that would be marvellous and we can get you in touch with them. Thank you, Matt. Next one. Um, so uh, close to my heart, I work in waste. This is about waste reduction. So uh, Kenilworth Repair Cafe had um, some funding to set up and make, make a start on their project, uh, different tools, different promotional paraphernalia that they needed um, in order to be able to run their repair cafe and that's now successfully going every month and you can see that the next one is in two Saturdays time uh, in Kenilworth maybe you've got something that you would like them to go and fix um, and then Meon Vale which is on the right hand side there 
they um, have bought a bunch of home composting equipment and water butts and they've been giving them away to local residents for free alongside advice about how to get the most of that equipment and they're also doing a wildflower meadow and they've got a few different elements within their project including home composting. Uh, we've also got a couple of projects where water harvesting is taking place um, and then we've got some other projects which in which are more about um, training and awareness raising so there's uh, one organization develops a newsletter that they send around to all of their uh, local people that live nearby uh, and there's a school climate change day as well and we're also keen for there to be projects around adaptation so adapting to the changing climate and uh, working towards uh, living more easily in hotter drier summers and uh, milder but wetter winters. Uh, thank you Matt. So that's uh, just a repeat of our previous page which was about our um, contact details um, and I, I believe that that's been put in the chat as well but maybe we'll just leave that on while we're having a Q&A session. So Tracy I think you can access the questions more readily now. So I can. Let's get thank started. you very much. Chris nice to see some um, some projects um, in real life actually after round one and thanks also for Matt for your overview of the fund. Sorry we had a few technical difficulties there it wouldn't be a good virtual session without a few gremlins so uh, we're all used to that after Covid aren't we and the way we are now. So ways of work is I'll run through the questions that have been um, logged in the chat um, and then it looks like we'll have a little bit of time to open the floor for questions as well. At the top of your screen or the bottom you should see a raise hand function after we've run through the questions, I'll open it up. If you can raise your hand, I'll come in order and then we're not overwhelming our lovely panel with too many questions all in one go. So I'll start off with the first question in the chat, if that's OK. So the first question is from Ian to say, last year, the majority of funding went to Stratford and Warwick areas. This year, you're prioritising the Neaton and North Warwickshire. What about rugby? Who wants to take that one? Andrew? I'm happy to come in and, uh, and comment. Thank you. Okay. So um, I, I think we've, we've got well over £300,000 in phase two that we want to invest in community projects. So, so we are talking about quite large sums of money and that shows the council's commitment to supporting community projects. Um, yes, it's true. Um, I think a disproportionate amount and I don't want to use that uh, that term sort of too too strongly but we did invest a lot of money in Warwick and Stratford and so we do want sort of a relatively even spread of money across the county so we do want to prioritise Nuneaton and Bedworth but also um, North Warwickshire but we are very happy to to continue to support projects in rugby so you know that potentially wherever you are geographically in the county you can get funding but we did want to make the point, especially about Nuneaton and Bedworth. So we're aware of a number of different projects, quite exciting projects coming forward. And we do want those projects to be successful and to bid into us. But we also want those projects to perhaps think wider. So not only about their absolute local locality, if you like, especially if they're in Stratford and Warwick, but how those projects could benefit the people of Nuneaton and Bedworth or North, North Warwickshire, perhaps, because those are our, our more priority areas. I hope that sort of like gives an indication in terms of what we're thinking. Thank you, Andrew. And there were there were some projects funded in rugby for round one, weren't there? I think from Matt's initial presentation. So it's not that there hasn't been any investment in that patch. It's looking at proportionate allocation of funds, I think. So the next question is um, also from Ian. To say um, they've identified their project, but are having difficulty identifying contractors who can do the work and give quotations. Are you able to identify contractors? I assume it's difficult um, for you I'll, to make I'll, recommendations. Yeah, I'll sorry. That. It's it's not something I think we've done in the past, um, but um, we really want projects to be successful. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, we can't intervene in a market. So I think that's something that you would you would really need to get involved in and make sure um, that you were getting best value for money. OK. Thank you very much on that one. 
Okay, so qu next question is from Martin Wood. How will you assess applications from Warwick District compared to, example, for example, Bedworth? He's going to take that one. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a, so I don't know whether people's buttons or computers aren't working as fast as they should be. I was expecting Matt <laughs> to jump forward on that one. But uh, I, I think we would um, judge all the projects fairly and evenly across the criteria that we've we've sort of like talked about tonight. Matt's talked about the criteria we're going to use. So we are we are particularly interested in, in you know in, in projects that do action climate change and the sustainability agenda. Um, so we want projects that actually have a have a, an effect and also a lasting effect. So legacy is one of the things that we've actually like pushed tonight. We want projects to have a community benefit and a legacy community benefit as well. Um, I think I think what we're saying is is that you know we, we've we've invested quite a lot of money in in Warwick and Stratford, so we're, we're less keen to invest more money in those areas. But if there are strong projects that come forward, we will look to fund them absolutely. Um, but you know I'm, I think I made the point earlier today that you know. Um, there are some strong projects. We already have funded quite a few strong projects and we are looking for people to think perhaps about how they can make their, their project more attractive to us by thinking about how they can help their neighbours in Nuneaton and Bedworth. Um, so, that, you know, we, I think we've made that point a number of times already tonight. OK, lovely. Thank you, Andrew. OK, so there's a question from Glyn Spence. Can the grant be used to enhance our current schemes running a primary school, i.e. raised flower and vegetable beds, the forest school, wildlife areas, etc., or do they need to be totally new schemes? So it's expanding existing provision is how I read that. If that's different take than you want, Glyn, pop it in the chat for me, but I think that's what we're asking there. Again, oh, Matt, go for it. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, OK. Um, schools are... Are interesting projects um, in the first case because we really need to understand that that school projects are accessible to all. Um, so if it's within the school gates, then that's something we'd look less favourable for because there's less community access. Um, but if the if if there's a lot of, of awareness generated from it, um, and we've got some projects that um, that are with children at school, um, but there's clear parent pester power, power then um, that's a particularly good project. Um, in terms of an existing project, if it if it transforms it and takes it to another level, yes, we'd be interested in looking at it. But for all of these, in terms of designing the project, as I say, we're happy to help. Um, so we're happy to have a chat about it before you write up the application. Sorry, Matt, your sound dipped right at the opportune moment. So I think you were saying that you would be favourable of projects that um, are open to wider participants than just the school caseload, is that right? And that, yes. You, yeah, OK. That's right. We'll, um, we'll make sure we, Rhianna and I will make sure we run through the questions and get a written answer for them as well, in case we've missed anything. We've had a bit of a sound issue there. Um, this one might be for you, Ruth, actually. Have you had any examples of projects from sports teams who are often at the heart of communities? Uh, yes, we have. So there's a uh, sports club in Stratford, a football club, and they've refitted all of their floodlighting to be LED and they've they've identified how much that's going to save both in terms of electricity, carbon and their and their own out, out financial outgoings. Um, so, yeah, that's that's been completed. And I think a rugby football team has approached us for this for this coming round. Uh, they might they've got a slightly different project I think but something similar so yeah you're absolutely right that sports teams sports team facilities like pavilions and sports community centres would be the sort of thing that is open to a wide range of people and can also be a great example for other community centres in the area and other sports centres across the county. Yeah, and you also, I think in one of your case studies, highlighted that Wollstone Sports and Leisure and Community Centre had, had um, an EV charging point, didn't you, as a, as a product as well. Your sound dipped out as well. So I think you said it was about flood lighting to LED to improve the energy efficiency of the, the pitch. And you've got another application potentially for another football type programme. I think that's what you said. <laughs> OK, next questions from um, Kirsty Aspiring Arts. Um, we've spoken to some of our young people about environmental 
local environmental issues in Nuneaton already. Some of the issues have already been suggested and they would like to address are littering parks, canals and having more wildflowers and trees in these areas. Is this something the programme could fund? Well, we, we did have an application um, from a litter picking group in the first round, which we didn't fund because it didn't address uh, the climate change element of uh, environmental improvement. So as well as an envi a general environmental improvement, it needs to be needs to specifically address climate change. Um, so um, not sure on that. And again, like Matt says, we can work with you to try and make it be as as, um, as fitting to the criteria as we can. But certainly in terms of enhancing the local environment with planting of wildflowers or trees or hedges or anything in between, those are the sort of things that we've certainly uh, funded in the past. I, th I think Kirsty, a little earlier on in the chat, Rhiannon put a link in for some of the case studies from round one. So I think there were some wildflower meadows and some of the initiatives. So perhaps have a look at those and then um, we'll link back through for, for your question a bit more broadly. So next question is from Brian. Um, the Bedworth indoor market has old sodium lighting. Could these be replaced with LED? And it also has a large roof space. Could they apply for solar panels? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, certainly, I mean, that's that's really ripe for a project. Um, it's a, um, a great cost effective scheme to replace sodium lighting um, and, um, and solar panels. We've done a number of solar panel schemes in the first phase. Ruth showed you an example, and we certainly welcome some in this phase too. Thank you, that's great. I guess what we're looking for is we were looking for community based projects. So the Bedworth indoor market facility would be owned by the borough council, I assume, and they've probably got plans to upgrade their facilities as part of their wider work towards climate change. So something similar to that, but more based in a community building. OK, next question is from Nikki. Um, she's highlighted that the criteria states that it excludes independently funded schools. Will schools that are part of a multi academy trust be eligible for support? I think what we're referring to there is uh, non state funded schools. Um, so, this for any state funded school, however they get their funding, then uh, the, the, the potential eligibility is there. What you need to make sure is that your project has got wider community accessibility than just the, the children and the 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 occasional school visitors. OK, thank you. Next question is from um, Angie. Uh, they were awarded a small grant in phase one of the fund. They've identified further developments they'd like to make as a second programme. Can they reapply in phase two? Yeah, hi there. Um, back to my answer um, for a previous question. I think if we can build on a successful project um, and take that a little bit further, then we'd be happy to have to look at that. Thank you. Um, and final, oh, there's a few more questions. Actually. Uh, next one is from um, Marion Humphreys. Um, I have a project that has had some councillor grant money, which was not enough. They're going to apply for a green shoots programme uh, for a bowls club in the village. Um, well supported, they're finding getting people to complete the works is a problem. So there's a similar question there about contractors. So that might be a, a challenge that needs a bit of consideration. Who wants to take that one? I'm happy to, to jump in and say that, you know, we sympathise with the marketplace at the moment or people trying to buy in the marketplace at the moment. Every project I'm, I appear to be involved in in terms of getting work done seems to take far longer and be more expensive than we actually anticipated. And, you know, we recognise this. We we would like to be able to help, but I think we are limited in terms of the amount of assistance we can get. So I think projects should find their own supplier, which are quite often actually looking at the, the projects we're funded in round one are actually local suppliers that, that may or well, well already be known to the, um, the project partners, if you like. So I think we would like to help, but I think there's very limited uh, scope for us to do that. Okay. One of the reasons why we've put in a big uh, funding window and we've talked, we've started talking to potential um, applicants even before that funding window opens is to give you plenty of time to hunt around for potent, potential suppliers. So hopefully uh, you've got 
uh, something like 14 weeks before the deadline, that should be enough time for you to uh, find somebody who can quote for you. OK, we've got a similar question to one we've answered, so I think we may not need to answer this again, but um, another applicant was awarded less funding than they asked for in phase one, so several of their aims could not be achieved. Um, what are the realistic chances of topping up our original funding if we were to identify clearly which objectives we were to prioritise in phase two? I think you've already covered that map that you would want to see the benefit of the additional funding and what it's going to achieve over the, the, the round one application. Obviously, it's a competitive fund based on the, the money available in the areas to apply for. Is that a fair view or anything you want to add to that? Yeah, and once again, um, we want to, to help people make successful applications. So we'll, we'll sit with people um, and um, we can work with them to make um, a successful application um, and we can explain perhaps why they didn't get that element of funding. OK, thank you very much. Um, next question is from David Milner. Do you fund feasibility projects? Our sports team suffers from severe flooding and flood mitigation is needed, but it will take some work to understand what can be done. Um, on feasibility studies, no. Um, so what we want is project, a project that delivers um, sort of tangible outcomes. Um, so we'd ask that that work's undertaken um, so that you know what you want to do. Um, but um, we do appreciate that feasibility studies do need to be done in some cases. I don't know if you can have that feasibility study done and completed um, before the application window closes. Um, if you can, then I think uh, that might be useful. Yeah, I think as well, David, if you want to link up um, with me via my email, I'll see if we can link you up with any funds that we're aware of feasibility studies separately and um, we can help with that perhaps. Um, and there's just a follow on comment from Brian to advise that the Bedwar Bedworth indoor market is used by the community, but he understands the comments and will be in touch. I think you've said, though, if it's a community impact programme, that's what you're happy to kind of consider for funding. So it's um, looking at the link with that, isn't it? I think that's it for all of the questions in the chat. I haven't seen any hands raised. Um, Marion, I noted you raised your hand, but I'm not sure if you've noted your question in the chat. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? No problem. It was answered in the chat. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. OK, right. I'm going to if I could ask um, you to stop sharing, Matt, I'm just going to flick my um, slides back on again. Awkward silence while I get that magic to work. Sorry, just one moment. My apologies. While I'm just trying to get these slides to work, so um, just wanted to advise you with the support that. Um, we as Warwickshire Community and Voluntary Action can provide to um, participants. Um, so we are here to support you with um, a range of um, measures as particularly voluntary and community sector organisations. So if you need support um, in terms of um, reading through applications, helping to make sure you've got relevant policies and procedures, insurances, etc. in place, um, that you have got um, you know, you're clear on the questions. If you're having technical issues and you, you want a bit of support to understand that before you raise a question with the Green Sheets team, for example, we can help you with those um, those areas. Um, the other thing um, that I've put on the slides is some local contacts because um, our team delivers, I'm going to give up on my slides, our team delivers across, um, across Warwickshire, so there are local teams in each patch. So um, what I'll do is when I send the slides out, I'll share those two with you so that you can see the support that we can provide. Um, from my perspective, I think that brings us nicely to the end of the session. We're five minutes early, so we can all go off for a well-deserved cup of tea. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, if you do have questions that you um, wanted to ask but haven't, um, feel free to drop an email to the Green Shoots email address or myself and we'll we'll get back to you. Um, and all being well, 
we should be in a position to share the um, resources um, link, um, the, well, the link to the filmed resource and the slides, et cetera, before the end of the week. Um, and Dan Whiteman has popped in the chat. He's happy to support any projects around tree planting and his details. So I think we can lift the, the chat comments out to, to share those details if you're happy with that, Dan. But thanks ever so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening and good luck with all of your uh, project applications for phase two. Take care. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Tracy. No worries. Thanks, Tracy. No worries, everyone. Take care. Thank you very Thank much. You. Goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, no worries. Uh, uh. You're able to stop recording, Rhiannon. Thank you, Martin. <laughs>